I'm John Hobby, um, and I've been with the Ecosystem Center since 1976. I started out as a, as a uh, limnologist, which means studying lakes, and that was, I think, the ideal way to teach students about ecosystems and um, just, just to teach people in general. And so right from the start, I al always knew that lakes, you have to have material coming in, material going out, you analyze these as well as just what's happening within the, within the lake. So you have the processes, the inputs, outputs, that's ecosystems study. So I started out working on Arctic lakes and then uh, I continued in the Arctic with a big project called the IBP, the International Biological Program. And that was a international program that the U.S. took part in. <coughs> and in the U.S. we had five major biomes, regional, geographic regions, and the Arctic was one. So as a part, because of my expertise on Arctic lakes, um, I was chosen to run a large part of the project that was at Point Barrel. And there was a big terrestrial project and quite a big aquatic project. <coughs> so that was the first time that I really had um, other people to work closely, closely with. And, and our charge at that time was to study the cycles of, and measure the cycles, of carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen, which of course we're still doing, and I'm still doing in the, in the Arctic. And so the IBP project was in 1971, 72, 73 in the field, and then in 74, and um, we published a giant book in 19, uh, 1980 on, on all of this. So we had a, a synthesis that brought it all together, but we had people from many different universities and uh, postdocs and graduate students all working. We had 28 people working on one rather small pond. It was only half a meter deep, so we had to have a wire um, tramway above so people couldn't, couldn't walk in the pond. That would have ruined it in about two days. There had been no, no uh, year-round research going on, or very, very little going on at the MBL before we came. And so that was one reason that the, well, the main reason that the Ecosystem Center was set up was the interest of the leadership of the laboratory, particularly Jim Ebert, to try to get people in year-round programs at the lab to help pay for the, for the facility and try to make it more than just the summer, summer um, res research and education place. <clears throat> so um, that was when Ebert recruited George Woodwell and they went around and got some funding. And so, uh, so when I came, what was available was uh, we started out using the summer laboratories, the summer, uh, in, in fact, the summer teaching laboratories in the, in the uh, LURB building for our research. So we take over part of the, uh, part of the uh, big teaching laboratories and use them during the winter. And of course they were used, we had to move out in um, June, July, August, but we were out in the field anyway, so it wasn't such a horrible thing, thing to have, have to do. With very nice facilities, um, but then we had, had to move out. But most of us were, up at Harvard Forest or up in Alaska. 
Um, so it was a uh, very, very different place in, in that there were very few staff. And in North Carolina, uh, for example, if I wanted to order a piece of equipment or anything, had to go through uh, a, a lot of procedures, paperwork, um, everything uh, was sort of the initial premise was that you were trying to cheat the state government, so you had to had to have uh, all sorts of competing bids and all these uh, very difficult. So when I came here, and about a year afterwards, I, we ordered a mass spectrometer for two or two or three hundred thousand dollars. So I just picked up the phone. And I just said I wanted a purchase order number, purchase order. No questions, no nothing. So they, there was a, uh, a very helpful trust here at the, at the lab. And for almost 100%, that's been uh, continued, and very few people have ever taken advantage of this. The other thing that was really important was that we could all work together on several grants. And so back in the 70s, you could have four or five PIs working together on a grant. And since that time, NSF grants have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So now it's difficult to even get enough money to support one person on a grant. You can't get two or three or four, except in exceptional cases. So I, I think we, we, we lost, we the ecosystem center, lost some of the interactions that had been going on. Uh, we were able to, to get some of this back when we were, got a, became a part of the LTER program, which emphasized a, a site and then a number of people working on various aspects. So that was sort of that um, idea, but it, it sort of the best time of our lives was some of those early, early grants back in the, in the late 70s, early, early 80s, when we could really work together um, uh, in, in a really interactive way, which means that you're out there arguing every week or every two weeks. It's difficult to, uh, difficult to do when everybody has their own little, little grant. But that was what I felt was different about the Ecosystem Center, that in fact people did work together um, in, in, in multidisciplinary uh, way and, and that we had examples out there of un, the major universities. They had all these ex, ex, expertise too, but they, everything that happened in the university uh, up to and including tenure decisions were always made at the departmental level. There wasn't any um, incentive for people to work together from different departments. So what were the goals? <laughs> well, the, the goals were survival for, for a start. Um, keep, keeping, we, we all liked the way the center had evolved and the people we got in. George Woodwell was very good at picking, picking good people. And this, of course, was at the lower levels, uh, but he, he had very good choices and um, he had good, good way of, of choosing people to come in. And one, once in, then people, th then the whole center didn't necessarily, ch we, we brought them in because they had interests and expertise in a certain area. And so it, it isn't as if the center then had a direction of their own that they wanted to go. Um, we had strong push for Arctic. We had um, a coastal um, 
uh, interests, salt marshes, estuaries, and the forests, you know, interests with Jerry Melillo and other people. Bruce Peterson was a part of uh, Jerry's early research, particularly when they began to go more and more into the, into the modeling. So, as the director, the, the goals were, were really to um, try to build up the, the endowment. The, the, the other thing that, that I did want to do as, as director was keep the good people that we had. So that, uh, in part, somebody like Malillo would get all sorts of offers. How did we keep him? Well, one way was to make him the co-director. And uh, also, there's also always pressure on the director. Well, why didn't you go to more foundations? Why, why, why didn't you go to the Arctic? Why didn't you go to the foundations? And kept giving us more money as if all the foundations had to do was to be asked and they would have heaped money on us. So it was not as the center, it was not, um, uh, it wasn't that under, understanding of the whole. So uh, the whole funding, funding, foundation picture. So that was one of Jerry's tasks as the new assistant co-director to beef up that part. Well, he got busier and busier. Uh, I got busier and busier. So, so we really didn't get terrible new amounts. We got a new program, which was the SES program. Uh, the educational program, and that, in that, in part, uh, through support of the Mellon Foundation and Jerry's ideas, and of course I was the only one really that had experience in teaching for ten years. So I, so we did a lot of the writing and early organization of that course. Um, so, so that was getting the funds, and then I would say <clears throat> the, the other thing that was, that, that I wanted to keep from what we had was a, a very collegial atmosphere. So at our weekly, no, our monthly meetings, everything was um, up for discussion. Um, we had we put together the budget as a group um, and they knew what the director was doing. So I had a chance at a sabbatical year, 1988-89, from the Royal Academy in Sweden. And um, so I went, but I was quite somewhat proud of the fact that I didn't have to brief them what people that what was happening. They all knew everything that was already going on. And so it, they could keep the continuity going. And um, I was still available, of course. This was first days of some internet. Uh, and Sweden was just getting the idea. It took almost two months to get permission to use a computer to get outside the country. We had, at the ecosystems, um, other people that were interested in, in processes, which is what the big uh, questions were. And uh, we were able to carry out some more research in the, in the Arctic. It wasn't the IBP any, anymore. And so I, I got uh, people like Bruce Peterson in working in the Arctic. And uh, we had uh, 
quite good support from National Science Foundation for, I don't know, about 15 years uh, to continue Arctic research, but not up at Point Barrow. We set up a whole new site, research site, in 1975. We were able to do that because at that time, the oil company was uh, building the pipeline. So they had a, a road, and we had permission to use this gravel road uh, that eventually would extend from Fairbanks up to Prudhoe Bay. And so we located our site about 100 miles south of Prudhoe Bay. And, and um, that is the site that we're still using today. So our research there started out to be this Arctic site that's called Tulik Lake. Um, started out to be only, only the aquatic research um, in lake studies. And we brought in people from other, other uh, institutions and we actually had money to put them on as re research scientists on the project. Um, University of New Hampshire was certainly one of those. University of Cincinnati, another. Um, and so we, we had a research group that f covered many aspects of the aquatic research up there. And we were able to get postdocs. And, and uh, it was quite, quite a success that in, in 1980, the LTER program started. You know what LTER is all about, and uh, in a national sense. Uh, and our Arctic LTER started in 1987 up at this Tulik Lake site. Now by that time, we, other people but had taken advantage of the location of a, a field camp and it, there were no towns within hundreds and hundreds of miles. So this was a place where people could come and, and have laboratory space, room and board. Uh, so it would be very productive for people to come, come up. And so people like Gus Shaver started from the ecosystems and Terry Chapin from Unif University of Alaska and Berkeley uh, started coming up to the same site in the, in the um, 19, 19, mid to late 1970s. So we began to get a terrestrial project. Uh, Bruce Peterson and I began working on the streams. So we, uh, that was some of the first stream work ever done in the Arctic. So, uh, so that was why it was a good site. We had lakes, we had streams, rivers, and um, it was in the foothills, so there was quite a lot of relief, and it was a good place for terrestrial research, and the mountains were only 15 miles away, so people could get up there for the terrestrial research and do um, mountain valley research, and lakes and streams up there too. So it was a good, a good site that we chose, proved later, later on. And uh, now there's a large field station the University of Alaska has set up. They could accommodate 130 people, um, room and board. And, and people come in and go out, come in for two weeks, go out, go out, um, go away. So there's a large turnover of of uh, people, scientists, and the Arctic LTR project, which is still at this time based at the, at the ecosystem center, has people there all summer. Um, I, put, I put a lot of effort into or running a big meeting funded ultimately by NSF that had to do with coastal eutrophication, coastal uh, changes in, in the coast. The LTER, large uh, 
or organization um, had no coastal projects at that point, back in the early, early 90s. And so we, yeah. so we, we got money to run a, a scientific meeting, which is to demonstrate to NSF or document um, to, uh, to NSF program people so they could use this. The, the community says there's a big need for more studies of eutrophication and we have to tie together the land and the water. Um, so we produced a, a big meeting here and a big report. And then they set up a whole new program at NSF. And this was funded by the oceanographers. So the ocean, ocean Studies Program, who up to this time had not been involved in LTR. And so, we, uh, so I was the di director then of this program for four or five years of, uh, of, uh, of an LTER-like program only directed towards coast, coastal, coastal systems. So we had a program in California, Bodega Bay, we had um, Georgia involved uh, with Sapo Island, we had um, Chuck Hopkinson was here then and he came through with a good proposal for working up at Plum Island. And then, then there was a I can't remember the Chesapeake Bay program. Anyway, there were four or five big projects. And the difference between that, the ocean studies and the LTER, was that the ocean studies people <coughs> insisted that when a renewal came along, it was completely open. LTER is mostly a renewal situation. You have to prove that your program is doing all these good things, <clears throat> but it, it isn't placed in direct head to head concentration with everybody else. So that was the difference. And so after two rounds of these projects that were five years, five year projects, then with consultation about with all of us, they actually merged this land margin ecosystem. LMER with LTER. And so the new money came in um, as the old projects um, timed out. And so then they did a new set round of, of uh, proposals. And two or three of the old LMER projects won, because of course they had all the background information they should have, <coughs> including. MBL Plum Island project. Well, I, I, I can't see how else we could tell what is happening on the planet without long-term measurements. The changes that have been going on slowly change, slow changes. We have to know that. But then I think that projection, one of our goals has to be projecting to the future what we think is going to happen. So one can then think about mitigation, all these financial questions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you have to do modeling for that. We have to bring in modeling. And that's one thing I haven't really mentioned um, that uh, Sutter has done quite, quite well. Ed Rastetter and Jerry Melillo with all his um, contacts, people. Uh, Joe Bellino is another one. Um, people who can actually uh, can actually do modeling in in science. Well, uh, so all so is is all the modeler needs in sort of a a, a 
a long-term view and, and making a model to, to exp explain the ch changes. Well, I don't think so. He has to know a lot more. We have to have process information and the experiments. And it's the experiments also that the center has really um, been very good at developing. Uh, the experiments that Bruce Peterson r ran and is still running on streams had been the leader in the whole field. And because we had Ecosystem Center and the LTER or this other big NSF project, we were able to um, come up with money to add stable isotopes to streams. Well, here's a wonderful tool. Bruce figured out what he could do and what he couldn't do, and the LTER uh, came, up, came up with enough money to pay for uh, $10,000 worth of, of uh, isotopes or whatever it was. Couldn't get money from NSF. Oh, that'll never work, never work. Three, or three different attempts. And so we proved that it could be done, which is another thing you know, that a center can do as an individual scientist. And, and why the LTER was, was, was good. To me, the pleasure of, of working with some of the best people in the world on these topics um, ha has been uh, really the, uh, the thing that really has kept me going and interested. And now I've been retired for six or seven years and I'm still writing chapters and oh, the other thing that uh, my kids grew up in knowing that I was enjoying life and so one of them actually is working in the Arctic LTER program. He's, he's at University of New Hampshire. He and I have written five papers together. together. <coughs> so that's just, just the, uh, having good friends. These guys are, are, my, are just my best friends. What more could you want?